Welcome to the Stonefield Ranch podcast, where we talk about horsemanship, ranching, and the American West from the eyes of cowboys. Have you ever had a grizzly bear sneak up on you while you were soaking in a hot tub? Our guest today has. In fact, he's gone toe to toe with a lot of grizzlies. In today's episode, we had the pleasure of sitting down with rancher and outfitter Mark Cardile. Mark owned and operated a ranch in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem for over 35 years, running a herd of cattle and taking hunters into the mountains in the fall to hunt trophy bull elk. Mark shares many encounters he's had with grizzlies, how his horses responded, what he's done to stay safe, uh, how you can recognize grizzlies that are more prone to attack, tips for training grizzly bears to stay wild and protected, and how the mismanagement of predator populations is leading to the decrease and relocation of elk herds. We absolutely love sitting down with Mark and hope you enjoy this episode as much as we did. Mark? You want to introduce yourself? <laughs> All right, uh, Mark Cardell. Uh, I grew up here in the valley, and uh, oh, I think it was around uh, ninety. Took off to Wyoming, and uh, been outfitting and guiding in Wyoming for the last thirty-five years. Awesome. So the way that I heard about Mark, Mark and I have a mutual friend. Um, and they were up scouting deer, I think. No, we were just uh, riding this spring. Oh, you were just on a ride. Um, and they saw a grizzly bear, and Mark thought it'd be fun to chase it down on the horses. And I thought, I got to meet Mark Cardell. <laughs> <laughs> well, it uh, was a long time ago. We, by chance, uh, discovered this sport. Um, <laughs> and then it turned into self defense. Uh, and I'll kind of explain all that. But. We were, I was young and packing in uh, the Teton wilderness for an outfitter. And uh, we were coming up over Trail Creek <clears throat> Pass. And uh, the way it worked, you had about, oh, 10 or 12 mules behind you, each one of us. We'd go in for six days with 10 or 12 guests up there fishing the Yellowstone on the thoroughfare. Awesome. And then the cook would bring in uh, the guests, and so she was behind bringing the guests in. And me and this young kid, he was from Wheatland, Wyoming, and uh, he was ahead of me. And he stopped and he said, hey, there's a grizzly out there. And it was a high mountain meadow, and this grizz was out rolling rocks. And uh, so we kind of tied up our string. There was a big pine tree between us and the grizzly out there. And uh, he says, hey, I want a picture. So he walks out there a little ways and stands, <laughs> and I take him a picture. And, and then he says, do you want a picture? I go, oh, yeah, I guess. So I walked out there, and then he took a picture of me. And then we came back, and we were just kind of resting there. <clears throat> he was a cowboy and so young and kind of looking for adventure. Yeah. He says, you want to rope it? I said, that's a good idea. <laughs> so we went over to our saddle horses and we jerked up the cinches and we were building a salute and we were doing all this behind the big pine tree so the bear couldn't see us. And uh, he says, do you want to head or heal him? <laughs> and I says, I'll head him. And so we went out there. I mean, we'd never done this before, so we didn't know what we were going to get into. <laughs> And so we went around that pine tree, and I was on a, a, a big uh, racetrack horse. He was triple A, so he could run, and he'd, he'd run cattle. We'd been roping on him quite a bit, so you get that rope out, he knows what the game's about. And so he's kind of excited, and then all of a sudden he sees this bear, <laughs> and so he's just kind of looking, <clears throat> and uh, we rode out there about, 20 yards, and then this old bear, he stood up, and I remember his old paws kind of flopping down. You could see all these claws, and I remember his nostrils kind of flaring, and so we're kind of looking at each other, and, and I said, oh, to hell with it. So we just over and under him, and we just busted into him, 
And that old horse knew what the game was, and that old bear just flopped in an instant, and he took off across there. <laughs> and we were just all going as hard as we could after this bear. And I'm sitting here swinging, and I remember that bear, I could see the flats of his feet. He was so stretched out. He was just running as hard, and I remember him <laughs> looking up at me, and I feel my horse kind of backing off because <laughs> he's smelling this thing. He knows what it is. And I'm asking him a little more, a little more. And all of a sudden, he just swapped and went downhill. <clears throat> and the bear this, did. The bear did. <clears throat> and then this young kid come over. And I remember <clears throat> he just, just perfect T-bone into that. And he threw his loop. And in an instant, that old bear planted and jumped and that loop hit him right in the shoulder and then we chased him down into the timber <clears throat> but once he got in the timber he outran us really quick uh, it's but wild over the years back at the ranch uh we learned it because w the ranch was right in the middle of, of grizzly country and we had young kids and guests all around and so from that experience we kind of started uh, harassing the bears when they came onto the ranch so they wouldn't come into the ranch. So it was kind of be aggressive to them. And I think we saved a lot of bears. We just never had any bear problems because we were the aggressor. And so that's what led into uh, this spring with uh, <laughs> our friend. We were out riding and out in the middle of the sagebrush I looked and there was this bear and so instincts <laughs> kicked in to <laughs> go after him. So he had a pretty good ride with us. Your predator instincts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Well, tell us kind of about the ranch, like how you got into doing that and, and you know, just how many years you've been doing it. Well, I started outfitting. I uh, bought my camp uh, in the early 90s. It was in the Smith's Fork and then uh, bought another camp in uh, Idaho. And uh, I spent all, all, all my life on the mountains and, and hunting and, and chasing cows. Uh, I <coughs> dated a lot of women, but never found one that wanted that lifestyle. And so uh, I found uh, a gal, her, she was born and raised in Jackson. Her, grandfather came into Jackson in 1924. Oh, so an original Jackson. Yeah, they, they, they've been in there for generations. And Ike started one of the hunting camps in the Teton wilderness in the 1930s. Cool. And then her dad and uh, brothers hunted it. And, and uh, so they were outfitters and ran all those old ranches at the base of the Tetons. Awesome. So there was a great history there. And so they sold out and went over uh, to Dubois and bought this ranch. And my camp cook knew her. And so we uh, ended up getting married and her folks owned this ranch. And so uh, we eventually bought into it and took it over. And uh, it, it one in a million place. I mean, everything out the back gate is wilderness, right on the boundary of the wilderness. That's awesome. So we had bighorn sheep, uh, grizzlies coming around. Uh, back then, we had a, a lot of elk and a lot of moose right there on the ranch. Wow. But since the wolves have come in and, and the grizzlies have just become infested, uh, our elk populations have gone down. Really? Just wiped them out. No more moose. Really? We used to see 20, 30 moose uh, in the river bottom, and I think it's been five or six years since I've even seen a moose. Wow. So it's just a lot of devastation. And we had a lot of bighorn sheep uh, in there, and, and they're really gone down. They used to issue 65 tags, and now we're down to 20 tags. Just in that wilderness area around yeah. you. What wilderness area is that? It's the Washakie Wilderness. Washakie. Okay. It touches the Yellowstone ecosystem. So uh, out the back gate, you can travel right into Yellowstone or into Cody or into Jackson, and you never cross a road. Wow. It's the largest roadless track left in the U.S. Wow. So you're, you've you got to be pretty close to Thoroughfare Creek then right there. Yep. Okay. Thoroughfares. 
Yeah, you can access all that. Back in the day, uh, the Forest Service was pretty lenient and you could trade outfitter days. And so you could uh, go on pack trips back in there. And so we could go out from the ranch gate and uh, end up in Turpin Meadows. And, oh, yeah. And do a progressive five, six day pack trip. Oh, my gosh. Or into Cody. And we did quite a few of them back in the day. <clears throat> and... Uh, so anyway, I wasn't married and uh, ended up meeting uh, my wife, Gretchen, and uh, we eventually uh, married and, and uh, took over the ranch and continued to hunt and pack trips and guess and have a, a good life. It's kind of uh, tough to raise your kids in grizzly country. Yeah. Uh, especially the numbers. Uh, we had a lot of bears. I remember one afternoon we were just bringing the kids up and uh, we had uh, the satellite TV for their cartoons. They, they were, you know, two, three, four years old and uh, we were just bringing them up. Uh, the ranch sits at 8,000 feet, so it really doesn't meld out till May before you can get up there. Oh, wow. And I remember I was on the phone with a satellite company and trying to figure out how to do stuff. It, the ranch is all alone in this valley and it's 15 miles north of town. So getting people out there is kind of tough. So you have to learn to do a lot of repair on your own. So I was on the phone with this uh, satellite company. and I look out the window and there's a grizz coming across our front lawn. It's one o'clock in the afternoon. Oh my gosh. And I said, I gotta go, I got a grizzly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they thought, but <laughs> they'd probably never heard that before. <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> so did you ever have any experiences where your kids were outside and grizzlies were we didn't. on the ranch? Or? Luckily we didn't. Um, we had a few of them come in. Um, the kids were there, but they, they were never uh, threatened that way. Good. And, and I think it's like I say, we, we were uh, kind of ad aggressive to, when the bears did come in to, to charge and... and uh, Just kind of train them that, hey, them, we're, not, them out. Yeah. we're not sitting ducks here. That and, and staying clean. I mean, keeping your garbage locked up so they didn't have a food source and a reason to come in. Yeah. Uh, we had this one couple, uh, really, really neat couple. We're still friends with them, and they're farmers from Illinois. And uh, I was down to the corrals, and we had the mare and colt out in the front pen. And uh, they're, they're really neat people. And uh, it just kind of all clicked. Uh, just kind of all of a sudden, everything focused on this. And this mare and colt comes running around from the lodge over the hill just busting and just by chance uh, here comes this couple walking up the the trail to the lodge and uh, the wife turns to the husband and says why is that mare and colt running and uh, being a farmer you know he just calm and he goes well it's because there's a grizzly behind him <laughs> 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 and just then my wife comes out and yells to the husband hey do you want a gun and he looks at the bear and looks at Gretchen and says, no, I think we're all right. <laughs> <laughs> and then the bear, you know, coming. And then, of course, the boys and I go out and jump on the wheelers and chase him off the ranch. Uh, man, how cool is that? I mean, that's uh, the series Yellowstone has gotten like a lot of, I don't know, accolades and a lot of people watch it and stuff but this is like the real stuff it's like <laughs> this is what actually happens <laughs> it's fun it it's a, a neat ranch uh, like i say a neat spot a lot of ranches in wyoming you have to trailer to trailheads uh, but this once you went there all the work was done to horseback mm. And uh, all, all, all the riding, you could just ride from the ranch. You could access so much country, huge, huge country. The upper camp was nine miles up wow. behind the ranch. So uh, you, could, you could take people on some neat, neat uh, rides. And then you get to the upper camp and they stay there. And 
then you can ride to up above Timberline to where a lot of people can't ever get to uh, because it's just too far. Uh, and so you can ride up to 11,500 feet. And once wow. you get up on the pass, it's just a sea of mountains. You just can't explain how massive that wilderness is. You can see the Tetons and into Cody and clear down into Thermopolis and the winds and uh, the Grovant. And it's, you're up above and so you don't see the valleys and it's just high peaks everywhere for as far as you can see. Wow. So Brian and Lundahl and I, that's our mutual friend. Um, we talked about going into the thoroughfare next year to, on, to pack in because I told him, before I die, I got a drink from the headwaters of the Yellowstone. <laughs> It's, it's, and I don't, who knows how much time you got, you know, but I think that one's in the works, but you should come on that. Since oh, I appreciate the invite. Since that's your, uh, that's your stomping ground there. I, I spend a lot of time up in there hunting. Yeah, I've been so far up the Yellowstone, I could jump across it. Wow. I call it the Valley of the Moon. Uh, and as you get so far up the Yellowstone, it splits. So there's the North Fork and the South Fork. And I was up the South Fork and uh, had a hunter up in there. I was working for an outfitter back in 93 up in there and uh, ended up killing a bull up in there. But uh, yeah, I've been so far up in there, you could just jump across the Yellowstone River. Gosh, not many people can say that. <laughs> <laughs> there's like... <laughs> There's a very small number, you yeah, know. Yeah, that's wild country. It's just remote. You get back in there and it just has a different feeling to it that just what you said, you know, not many people have been there and you get the sense for that. It's just wild country. It is. It's it's so much different. That, so I've been packing into the Uintas in Utah for years, but it, it doesn't feel like wilderness area. There's always camps. There's always people. Like you, you don't get away from them. But this year... End of June, beginning of July, I went up with Brian and the, another friend of ours, Ryan Lishman, and we went up the Gray Bowl from the Matitsi side, and we were 12 miles up, and I think it's Unit 61, so it's 20, 30 miles east of Yellowstone, but that's how it felt. I mean, just wild, wild yeah. country, and we saw a mama grizz and two cubs, and just more bull elk than I've ever seen in my life. We saw more bull elk than we saw cows. Like it was wild. But yeah, I mean, 10 minutes in, or 10 minutes into the ride, there's actually probably only 200 yards. We saw a grizz track that was like pretty good size when we were riding through the river bottoms and the willows, just right off the trailhead. And then I don't know, probably 30 or 40 minutes later, we came across a huge wolf track, and it just it makes it makes my hair stand up a little bit knowing I'm not maybe top dog anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on your horse. If you can train him to run grass, <coughs> you're all right. <laughs> well, I had a <clears throat> I had three with me. So the one I was on, I'm pretty confident we could he's a son of Peppy Sandbadger and just an ornery mean thing and I'm like he he could hack it but the other one I was on I'm like ah he's too weak hearted I don't <laughs> think he could <laughs> I don't think he could have done it that's awesome so Mark I love talking horses what's what's kind of your preferred you have like a preferred bloodline a lot of outfitters like half drafts like what's what's kind of your preference what have you seen work over the years uh I like a good quarter horse, um, and not necessarily uh, a specific line. Uh, I like to run in quarter horses just because I still go out and get hired day ride to go ride for cattle. So I like the athletic part in the horse, a horse that's going to get you there to move a cow. Yeah. So I still uh, like to quarter horse, uh, of course, you know, big heavy set. Uh, quarter horse is what you what you look for uh, and I, over the years I would look for confirmation but now I look for mind first uh, it didn't bother me to hit the ground but <laughs> I think you get a little wiser smarter over the years and you start looking for what's between the ears first but uh, I, for hunting and mountain uh, trail rides, I really like the half drafts. I still have some half drafts. 
back in uh, when I started outfit and I started breeding for the half draft. And uh, you get that bloodline that you like. And I had a couple of uh, draft mares, the Percheron mares is yep. what I like to cross with. Yep. And then I'd go to uh, a quarter horse <clears throat> stud. But I still have uh, bloodlines from 35 years ago that are working for me still. Awesome. <clears throat> uh, a colt or a, a horse that I uh, raised up. And uh, talking to my father-in-law, he, he kind of the same thing being in the ranching and outfitting business. He had bloodlines and horses that worked for him for 30 years. And it's kind of neat because I, I don't think a lot of people uh, realize that you have that kind of like a generation of horses that are working for you. You know, you have your, your human side of it. <clears throat> Our kids will be fourth generation Wyoming kids in the business. <clears throat> and then you have the horse side and they also are third and fourth generation working and, and taking care of the business. Yeah, that's so awesome. <clears throat> that's why, so our, we've got a ranch that sits on the Smith's Fork um, right there in Cokeville. So um, it's, I, I love that area and I'll be, I'll be either third or fourth generation. My, my great, great grandpa, he sold the ranch up in, I think it was around Three Forks, Montana. And then he came down, he liked Cokeville and then he bought a place in Star Valley. So those two places were where I grew up chasing cows and um i i don't know i love wyoming <laughs> yeah it's a neat spot yeah that's where uh cokeville's where i first got started i was working for a cattle buyer and uh, we went into cokeville and we were looking at this guy's cattle and he said he's an outfitter too and I, I was probably mid-twenties and I was kind of getting tired of uh, the cows and, and not making much money and yeah. I always liked, <laughs> for some reason, it just that romantic lifestyle of hunting and camps and horses. And So I talked to him every chance I got when we were sorting through the calves and at the end he says, well, I got a pack trip, he says, we're taking some people into Lake Alice. He oh, yeah. says, why Love don't it. you uh, come along and I'll see what you, you don't know. And so I, I just jumped at the chance. And so uh, we went up there and some boys from California and it turned out to be uh, the grandson of Paul Harvey. Oh, really? Yeah, so sitting around cool. the fire, uh, there was some neat stories and uh, one of the owners of the company had been into some movies and so I didn't know it at the time, and then he got telling his Is it Stuart Peterson? Yeah. Still telling his stories. And so anyway, we went into Lake Alice and had a good time, and then they hired me for the fall, and that was my first guiding experience, and, huh. and then eventually went in, and a year or two later bought a hunting camp. Okay. Yeah, that's <clears throat> awesome. So Stuart is my dad's cousin. Oh, really? And his son, Landon, that runs a ranch now up the fish hatchery, is a really good friend of mine. So we go brand for him every spring. Um, but, yeah, I like – I love that crew. That's that's a good group of guys. Yeah, they, we, God didn't make them any better. No. Yeah, we – in fact, Stuart uh, hauled me to Colorado. <clears throat> a lot of fun stories down there. <laughs> <clears throat> he he uh, vested in a hunting camp down there. But we just ran into him over, I'll bet it's been 30 years, and we ran into him in a horse sale oh. and having to sit right behind him and uh, started talking. It was like you'd never left, you yeah. know. I mean, just a uh, salt-of-the-earth guy, and we visited for a couple hours on the old days, and my wife was there and, and kind of remade the connection there. Yeah, that's so awesome. Well, I kind of want to go back to, you know, you talking about your generations of horses, because I think, you know, a lot of people go buy colts, like myself included, and it seems like you just kind of, it seems like you probably learn a horse a whole lot better when you know, when you've known the sire 
and the sire before that and the dam and the dam before that like it, it just seems like you'd probably get to know them a little better yeah you you know what mom did uh that mare that i had one one fall she packed over 20 bulls into camp for me and that same characteristic wow. comes out in this colt or in her cult, and I still have this horse today, and he is just, uh, he's 20 plus years old, but he's still got that drive that she does, but yet it's quiet. I mean, he's never bucked, and uh, just a big, solid mountain horse, and uh, if we were still in the business, <clears throat> you would still be breeding for that because, you know, all you have to do with them is just put a saddle on them when they're two years old and go down the trail. They're not, just not going to give you any problems. Wow. And at four o'clock in the morning when you're starting guiding, you really don't want any problems because you're going in that rough country. And uh, the old saying is the outfitter does 80% of his work in the dark. Yep. And uh, you're, I don't know how many times you're uh, run into problems and it's the middle of the morning and it's dark and you can't turn on the flashlights because the horses will spook and scatter. And so <clears throat> you want everything to go just as much good as you can because outfitting's tough anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you're on frozen mountains or mud or, and you just got to have horses that you can trust. And uh, ones that are mountain bred, uh, I remember coming off of that mountain so many times, uh, the storms gathering and it's black and it's dark. And like I say, you can't turn on the flashlights because it messes up their sight. And most of the time they really spook of the shadows. And so you put all that trust into that horse, you're coming off of there. You can't even see your saddle horn. Wow. And you just listen to him and he he wants to go here in your mind maybe you're up here but he knows exactly where he's at and so he turns and goes down this trail and then eventually maybe you see some something that you recognize in the dark and you know you're on the right spot but you just got to put all that trust into that horse to get you back to camp and it takes a long time to trust a horse like that and like you say if you have that generation of of horses behind you, you don't second guess it so much, you know. Well, mom did this and dad did this, so I'm trusting you. And now a word from our sponsor. I will not bow to any sponsor. Today's podcast is brought to you by Canvas Getaway. Canvas Getaway is the ultimate glamping experience, and they deliver to you. If you're hosting a retreat, if your mother-in-law is coming into town, if your wife kicked you out of the house... Or, if you simply want a glamping night out, they have you covered. Canvas Getaway offers delivered furnished tents with memory foam mattresses to any location, on any occasion. With a stacked cooler containing the beverage of your choice. Recently, I had the opportunity to stay in a Canvas Getaway tent on Antelope Island before the Buffalo Roundup. It was a great night's sleep. Highly recommend it. Go to canvasgetaway.com and book yours today. That's so cool. It's just like another level that most people don't get to with their horses i just like that's that's awesome i had a buddy he had a tag up in around whistler he had a i think he got an elk and then he he got to go shoot a wolf too so they were five or six hours from camp and he kills this pretty good bull they load up the horses they start heading back and he was just exhausted so he falls asleep while he's riding back to camp and he wakes up, I don't know how much longer later. I mean, this is Grizz country, and he's covered in blood from cleaning out this elk. You know, like every, everything within 100 miles can smell this guy. And uh, he wakes up, and there's nobody around him. Like, the guys he was with were gone. And he's like, he was pretty new to horses at the time. But he's like, I didn't have any other choice than to trust that horse. He said, I just dropped my hand right on his neck and just let him walk and he said there were parts where we were in rivers up to my waist and it was pitch black and he said <clears throat> three o'clock in the morning we rolled into camp <laughs> he said that horse knew exactly what he was doing he said it just gave me another level of trust and that that outfitter up there they would actually pack on horses from the time they were either three or four 
to when they were about 10 and they didn't really let anybody ride them until they were eight or 10. Just, they were just learning the country and the trails and stuff. So anyways, I, I thought that was cool. They, they know it's amazing. Um, there was a place that we rode here when we were kids and we would push cattle up the Canyon and we would ride up and then there was a drift fence. So we would turn into the right tie up, rest for a minute, then we had to kind of fix the drift fence and shut the gate while the cattle worked up the canyon. And years later, uh, you go riding up there and that horse just automatically turns right and stops there. I mean, it's amazing. They, they recognize no country uh, from years later they remember the trails and know it. If the person just sits and listens to them. You know, you're, a lot of guys, I think, just get going down and the horse wants to turn this way, so you correct them and go. But if you let them kind of maybe go in there and do their old habits, you're learning how to listen to them. I remember my nephew, he come up and worked for me. And I would take him in there and... Uh, We'd have uh, lunch and then we'd head out and I would say, okay, uh, you know, they're teenagers. I says, lead us home. And so I was sitting there watching him and we had six or eight people with us and he was leading. And I see his horse just kind of very slightly want to go to the left. And he corrected and kept going down the main trail. And I let him go down there for a little ways and I said, hey, I said, you should have listened to your horse that's the trail we need to go on. I wanted him to go down the trail to see if he recognized that he had missed the spot, but he, he's young and just not paying attention. Yeah. And so uh, we brought him back, and from there he listened to his horse, and his horse took him in. But uh, it's just the little twinges, and like you say, trusting the horse. Uh, I don't know of many mountain horses that won't lead you home. You get going hunting and you never stay on the trail, you know, you're just yeah. cutting through the country. And it's amazing, you just let that horse go, how they remember all those little turns and stuff going back. And they will follow the same trail all the way back. You're going down through the timber and you look down and there's your tracks coming up and he's following them going down. Well, <clears throat> and even, even beyond that, um, this spring, when or this summer i guess when i was up with brian we uh so we went in to camp one way following these river bottoms and then we found a better way coming out where we didn't have to cross the river because this year the water was so high every time we took a, a string into the river we were getting blown down 25 30 yards you know i mean it was just high and fast so we were like we don't want to cross the river anymore um so Anyways, we, we got up um, to camp. We ended up riding over this mountain, down this ridge, and then we came out a different way. And our horses still knew the direction. They, they, they knew they were headed home. You know when they hit that gate where yeah, they, uh, after they a pack home. trip and they're like, <laughs> <laughs> we, we know where we're headed and just, just get out of our way, you know? So it's, it's just crazy their sense of direction, like how intelligent they are. And they put on that act, I remember. Well, they still do it, but you're up there 10 miles and you're sitting there spurring them because that's all they can do to get up the mountain. They're just <laughs> tired and wore out. And then you turn them home and uh, you have to hold the reins to keep them from running home. Yeah. You know, they just put on that act of, oh, I can't go anymore. I got I'm no tired. more energy <laughs> until I know there's a barn <laughs> or a trailer getting me out of here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're smart animals. Yeah, that's so awesome. I, I, there's not much I love more than ponies. You know, that's that for me is, I mean, I love going into the mountains, but for me, it's almost as much about the horsemanship as anything. Oh, yeah. You know, that's, that's what I, and like you, I like a good quarter horse. Like just, just something that's cow bred that, you know, knows its job. And I've, <clears throat> I used to really like the smaller lines, you know, that could work a gate good and cut and some of that stuff, but, and I still do, but anymore, like with the type of riding I do, you know, up in Wyoming and stuff, it just, you know, you kind of need something sometimes with a little more bone under it. So you do. Yeah. That's rough it's country. It's hard to find something that's like, 
that's perfect, you know? None of them are, and I shouldn't be. It's I've said this before, but uh, it's kind of like, looking for horses is kind of like dating. Like, even if you did find a perfect one, you're probably not good enough for it. So you just... <laughs> yeah, you're going to mess it up. <laughs> yeah, it's a, you're going to uh, teach it bad habits. That's right. So what was... Uh, What's maybe been your favorite trip you've packed in? Uh, do you have one that kind of stands out to you where you were like, man, this one was just, it, it was the top? Uh, or it just kind of all was awesome? Not necessarily the a single trip. Um, we I was younger when I was in the Teton wilderness and we just had a lot of fun back in there. Um, <clears throat> I went back in a f just a couple of years ago. A, a good friend of mine called and, and uh, needed help setting his elk camp. And it had been probably close to 20 years before I had been back in there. And so I was able to ride and see that country again. And it's amazing uh, how quick your memory comes back. I guess maybe like a horse, you recognize the country and the trails and, and where to go. But... I think more so was behind the ranch, the upper camp uh, in the wilderness up there. There was a high mountain meadow, and I spent a lot of time up there. And I think probably that setting is probably more special than than any of them, just because uh, we took the kids and the family up there. If we had a, a break in the ranch, we would throw together a pack and, and run up there for a, a weekend and pack with the kids. And, and uh, just over the years, all the guests you got to share that country with. And uh, it's not as far as ride. You get back into that Yellowstone country, you're going 25 miles. And it's just as wild country behind the ranch, and it's only nine miles. Yeah. You're just kind of tucked right into it. And, yeah. Uh, I, a couple of years ago when I went back in there to set his hunting camp, I realized maybe it was a, it's a long ways in there. <laughs> the last summer I worked there as a kid, I remember running the trips in and out, and I'd made 18 trips in and out, and it's 25 miles one way. And so you Holy put cow. a lot of miles on when you're a packer in that country. Well, I've, I've heard, uh, in fact, I talked to a guy that from, te he's from Texas. Um, he rides for heroes and horses. Um, I don't, I don't know if you know that a little bit. It's for veterans that, you know, are having PTSD. So they'll go ride in the mountains for months and months. Like they'll spend all summer up in, uh, Wyoming or in Montana. And then they'll go into that thoroughfare and I think Hawks, Hawks rest, Hawks, Hawks rest. He said, we, we logged over a hundred miles in in just over a week this last summer packing i mean you can log a lot of miles back in that country yeah yeah so what would be your advice for people kind of going into grizzly bear country with their horses like anything that you'd you'd kind of tell them yeah yeah that's our friend brian he was a little nervous going in there so that's what he kept pounding me and uh I think it comes down to um, if you know the bears a little bit and how they work, you know, they go through their nose. And so if you keep a clean camp, you go, you're going to cook in that, yeah. but that's an odor just while you're cooking. So it's out in the air for a short amount of time. If you have a consistent odor like a dead animal, uh, a bear's going to smell anything dead in five miles away, and that's going to draw him. So if you keep your odors down, <clears throat> you know, you got to cook and eat. And uh, we've never had uh, uh, problems in camp because we kept a, a clean camp. And if they do come in, you make sure everything is up and out of the way so they can't get a food source. If they get something to eat, they will come back. Mm. more times than not, not all the time. But you you keep things uh, locked up and your odor's down to a minimum. Uh, that's the thing that's going to bring a bear. And he may come in because he's young and curious. Maybe, you know, you're back in the wilderness and, and you run onto a bear that hasn't 
had a human encounter, but there's two different kinds of bears. And I learned this at the ranch. And uh, I remember one spring, there was a little pass and I walked up, I was hunting bear, walked up this pass and come up and sat and was overlooking this uh, high mountain basin. And I was sitting there and I looked down and I saw this big grizzly coming up. He was working up through the timber and he wasn't on the same path that I was, but he worked up there and he was gonna to come to that pass. And right when he came to that pass, he smelt my order and he turned and ran away. And that was a couple of hours since I had walked through there. And I see that a lot with wild bears. Wild bears, if they smell you, know what you are, they're gonna leave because they're wild. And a lot of the problems that we had at the ranch was the tag bears. Really? So I told the boys, I said, if you're out there and you run on to a tag bear, I said, just leave them alone because they will kill you. And so the game and fish, it's hard to say they have their codes in that, but um, either they're transplanted because they were in trouble in Montana or West mm -hmm. Yellowstone, so they bring them down and they dump them out, and, or they're doing studies. And... I think those bears, even though they're, they're out and sedated, they're still being handled and they lose a little bit of human fear while they're being sedated. Mm -hmm. And I think there's probably points of argument on that, but all the problems we had with bears and they were wearing tags. Interesting. I remember one time all the, all the guests were going into town for an event <clears throat> and my wife and I, uh, stayed behind with the kids and I went up to the house and I said hey there's a grizz out here do you want to go look at it so we hopped on the wheeler went down through the corrals and out across the meadow and and then we got across the river and there was an upper bench and it's probably oh maybe 50 acres that's all clear and he was out there just rooting around and I drove up there on that bench and a four-wheeler people coming that bear never even looked up. Really? And he, he was wearing two tags. Huh. So, you know, a wild bear, you wouldn't have even made it to the river and he would have been gone. But mm. that just shows you he could care less. Interesting. And, and he, he will come kill you. He, even though he's not acknowledging you, he knows you're there and he just has no fear. Did you ever have to shoot one in self-defense or you... Were, you had enough bear sense to kind of keep them at bay most of the time. Most of the time. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, because you hate to see them. You hate to have to shoot one or something, but at the same time, if it's you or them, it's going to be them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they make a lot of bears. They only make one person. So. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, Mark, we really appreciate you coming and talking about some of your stories. I mean, it's just so cool. You don't hear stuff like this very often, and there's there's kind of what Hollywood puts out, and then there's the real version. And so I think it's just cool to talk to a guy that's really been there and done that. Well, I appreciate the invite. It was good meeting you and uh, fun going over old times. Yeah. Most people, I know my kids uh don't like to listen to the stories i was telling this guy a, an elk story and we got in the truck and my boy goes ah, i never thought that was gonna end <laughs> so i don't tell stories much so it was good to reminisce do your kids still like to come up and ride do they like pack trips or are they not really yeah they've hit the teenage uh years they maybe i they spent too much time. It seems like the kids that grow up on it, they want to leave, and the kids that don't have it Great. want it and, and desire it. And uh, they spend a lot of time on horses and around the ranch, and uh, uh, once in a while they'll get on, but it's electronics and, and friends now, mm -hmm. so they don't have any interest, and, which I think is kind of good. You're looking at the the way the wildlife population is, I would really hate to make a living outfitting anymore. Really? Yeah. The, the elk and deer have just gone down. <clears throat> I know you shared with 
uh, the limited quota units. But I think, see, you're not very far from where we were. And just my theory is there's so many bears and wolves up there that the elk are migrating out to those areas where their population isn't. You look around Rock Springs out there in that flat, that elk population has really grown. There's over 1,500 really? elk out in Rock Springs in the sagebrush. Wow. So I think they're just kind of running them off the hill. Uh, when I went into uh, the Teton Wilderness and set that elk camp, this is in September, two years ago, <clears throat> we saw six grizzly and one bull elk. Wow. And back in 93, when I was guiding back in there, it was just incredible. I mean, that's the, the premier elk because you're next to Yellowstone. And so, I mean, as growing up, that was the place to go hunt. You could hunt elk September 10th with a rifle, you know, right during the bugle season. But now they've, and you could go till November 15th with that. Now it opens uh, September 20th and closes October 20th. Hmm. They've just cut the the opportunities down, and it's it's tough to make a living uh, outfitting anymore. Wow, that's uh. So what what do you think the solution is? Like, what are they? Are we just not managing predators well enough? Then is that the problem? Yeah, a lot of uh, wardens know what the population is, but you have that political struggle. You know, we almost got the grizzly season open here a couple of years ago. They actually drew tags. And then the people in Jackson sued and got it shut down. Really? Yeah. I mean, I see a grizzly outside town in a hay field. I've seen him there a couple of years. Just outside of Jackson? Dubois. Dubois. In a hay field. You could see the windrows, and he was out there. He eaten uh, the hay. And you've seen him in the same yeah. spot. Yeah, he was there for a couple of years. They finally removed him because he went close to the school. <laughs> but, I mean, that's not grizzly country. We just got back from Montana to relatives up there. And Great Falls, which is central Montana, yep. grizzlies went through Ulm, Montana this year. Four grizzlies. That's a long ways from from the Bob Marshall from the mountains. I mean, it's not just Wyoming, uh, it's Montana, and the grizzly populations just become infested. One night we brought the kids in, we were just getting them into the house, <clears throat> and on that bench is, is kind of a favored spot for bears, and everything just hit right. The breeding season for the bears, the grass, but that night I saw nine different grizzly bears from the house. Wow. And uh, the amount of bears uh, that are there that are killing calves, uh, the wolves that are up in there. I see what it was 20 years ago and what it is today. We just do not have the elk population. And people aren't going in there. Uh, we used to have a lot of horse uh, hunters in there. You, I, don't, I think for the last five years, uh, I see maybe one or two horse camps in there. People are just, they're more backpack uh, people going in there. Mm. And they're scared of the bears. You know, you get tired of it. You, you just don't sleep on the mountain. When I was in the Smith's Fork, you could sleep and for the afternoon when you're guiding. Uh, I sleep under my horse if I'm uh, uh, up guiding at the ranch because you know, the horse is going to tell you something's coming in. Yeah. You, you just have to always look over your shoulder. I don't know how many times I went through the timber and all of a sudden you just, it's like being in a crowd, all of a sudden you look at someone and you make eye contact because that person's looking at you and I don't know what it is, the energy or something's looking at you and that's, you know, all of a sudden you just turn and look and you just make eye contact. And you're walking through the timber and you get that same thing and you turn and look and there's a bear sitting there looking at you. And he's 20 yards away. They're just always <laughs> around and always there. And you've, you've got to uh, never sleep. You've always got to be looking. Wow. Well, I, uh, whenever I'm in bear country, I've got 
a little border collie that sleeps right outside my tent because I know he'll be way more alert to it than I will. Yeah, at least he'll uh, let you know. Yeah. There's, <laughs> yeah, there's good stories with that. <clears throat> <clears throat> I always took a sawed-off shotgun double barrel with uh, three-inch mags because the bear's never coming in at daylight. He's going to come in at one o'clock in the morning, and the only thing you're going to see is this black blob running through the night if you go out there in the tent, and you're going to take this little pistol and you're going to do something, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Three inch mags, uh, double barrel, both barrels, it's over. And you don't have to aim, you know. If, if it's a short distance, uh, he's done. <clears throat> that's, uh, that's probably some good advice. In fact, that's, that's what I ended up getting this last year because I, you know, I was going to haul a pistol in and Brian said, ah, he said, Mark Cardall, <laughs> he'd tell you to get a shotgun. <laughs> And I thought that makes sense because I'm not that good of a shot anyways. And so if I'm shaking and got adrenaline going through me too, like I better just have a wide spread, widespread pattern. <laughs> it's like a bucking horse. I mean, the first time you get on a bucking horse, it's like, you know, your mind's everywhere. Until you've played the game a couple times, do you realize while you're on the bucking horse what to do to get him to shut down yeah. and get your mind collected? And it's the same thing with bears. All of a sudden, a bear is how much power do you give them? And so you always hear these stories, oh, this guy shot this grizzly 19 times and he still ran away and killed him. I mean, bears are bears. They're going to bleed and die if you hit them in the right spot. You don't have to have a bazooka to kill them. <laughs> you, you, they're going to they're gonna die. They've been killed with 30-odd sixes. And it's how much power do you give them? And so if you've seen them at close range and you've played this game before, it's, it's not a big deal, but your mind is in a different collected state so you can analyze what to do. You can think. We were back in the Teton wilderness hunting, <clears throat> me and a good friend of mine. We were working along these cliffs hunting deer. And here come this grizzly. And he was working below us. And this friend of mine is, is a little more nervous of bears than I am. And we sat down and thought, well, we'll wait for this bear to go. And all of a sudden, this bear turned and started coming up the hill toward us and just kind of kept coming and coming. And I was watching the bear, and I seen the, the nostrils flaring. So I could tell that she's trying to figure out what we are. And it just kept getting closer and closer. <clears throat> and I, I don't know why I did it, but I just picked up a rock. And it was on a steep hill, and I winged it, and I hit her at the side of the head. And then she whirled and ran away. But she got really close. I mean, if you can hit a bear with a rock, it's, it's got to be pretty close. Either that or you missed your calling as a major <laughs> league pitcher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I turned around and that friend of mine, I would have shot that son of a buck a long time ago. <laughs> it's just, you know, kind of reading the bear and, and the situation. <clears throat> I don't recommend doing that, but I could tell that that bear wasn't aggressive. And being in the wilderness probably hadn't been around humans very much. Yeah. Uh, people just don't go in that wilderness very much anymore in the part that we were in. That actually gives me a little hope because I get tired of seeing people on pack trips. Like sometimes they just don't want to see anybody, right? So it gives me hope there's still places like that out there because social media has made it really cool to go out into the woods, you know, or out into the mountains. Um, you know, it didn't always used to be that way. And, you know, now there's, that's actually what I like about Grizz Country is it, it kind of, it's just scary enough that it keeps people oh, from right. wanting a weekend trip up there, you know. Yeah. And they're starting to get, well, I shouldn't say starting, but people are getting more and more mauled. Yeah. Uh, the more people that go in there and the more bears, the more chances you're going to have a problem with them. And if people... Like say, if you haven't played the game before, you can end up in trouble really, really quick. 
Yeah. Gosh, that's that's some good advice. We'll see uh, if I ever come across that because I I haven't been. I mean, I've seen them from a distance, but I haven't been in close proximity to them. You know, not <laughs> not outside of Yellowstone, anyways. <laughs> you know. Well, we like I say, we had the house in the grizzly country, so um, you can't sure. learn their behavior. Yeah, and, you're just around them and. It was just my wife and I, we were newly married and we had a hot tub and I was down working and I walked up uh, to the house and she was making supper. <clears throat> and she said, why don't you go out in the hot tub? And she says, I'll finish supper. Oh, that's a good idea. So I walked <laughs> out and I'm sitting in the hot tub and same thing. All of a sudden, you just know something's looking at you because my mind was on, you know, what needed to be done and, and the next day. And all of a sudden, I just stopped and I turned. And we had the fence around there, and there was little uh, slats in the fence that you could see. And I whirled over my shoulder, <clears throat> and I could see something moving. And it took a minute to catch up looking through those slats. And it was a big old bear walking down the road. Oh and I must have sounded like a flock of geese coming off that hot tub because there was the, the pump house that was there and I was climbing up the fence to get to the, the uh, roof because I didn't know what this bear was. I just saw he was there. I didn't know if he was coming through the fence or not. So my reaction was to flee. And so I, got, I was on the fence and I looked and I saw this big old rump running through the trees because he must have scared, the scared both of us was petrified. And then it made me mad. So I walked to the house and got my sawed off and I went out and finished my soak and waited for him to come. Oh, that's good. That's funny. Flock of geese. Mark, thanks for coming. That was fun. You bet. Thank you. I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in to today's podcast. Hope you had as much fun as we did. If you have any topics that you'd like us to cover or people you'd like us to interview, please post those in the comments section. We would absolutely love to hear from you. As always, you know it's coming. Like and subscribe to the channel. Helps out a ton. Happy writing. Adios.